Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll learn about North Dakota's premier Native American storytellers. But first, joining me now, our guest is longtime historian and senior archivist of the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County, Mark Peel. Mark, thanks so much for joining us oh, today. It's my pleasure. Thanks, John. Well, as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay. Well, I raised in Hunter, North Dakota, and uh, I went to the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks. I got a BA in history. I started out in journalism and uh, decided that probably wasn't my, my bag. So I figured as long as I was at college, I'd study something I really, really love. So I switched to a history major and uh, graduated in 1978 and uh, I could not find a job. So uh, um, uh, I worked for an armored car company for seven years, I hauled money around the upper Midwest in a big iron box. That, 38 on my hip, and uh, did that for for a long for seven years, and then uh, I, back in those days, uh, the State Historical Society, of North Dakota MHS, Minnesota Historical Society, used to advertise positions available in the local newspapers, and I'd, I'd apply, and on, almost invariably get a nice note back saying, "Sorry, or one of our volunteers filled in, took the job." So I said, "Well, I, I can do that." So. Uh, um, I started working as a volunteer for the Clay County Historical Society, as it was called at the time, working with a glass plate negative collection, a photographic collection, for, and um, realized that um, some of this stuff is not exactly intuitive and uh, handling proper handling of uh, artifacts. So uh, uh, I decided to educate myself. I went to NDSU's library and read through every book that they had on archives management and th theory and practice and uh, photo preservation and things like that. And uh, uh, in 1980, after about a year of volunteering in 1986, um, the, the organization moved into the Heritage Outcomes Interpretive Center. At that time, they expanded the staff and uh, I got a half-time job and uh, then I went full-time on the 1st of July and I've been there ever since. Well, it was an interesting uh, route there. Uh, Obviously, you're retiring soon. Yeah. I want to wish you the best of luck with that. But Thank you. you were here to talk about your distinguished career. That's how you got there. But what all did your job entail over the years? Well, I'm responsible for um, uh, the corporate records and the uh, or, um, manuscript photograph collections that we have. Um, I do a lot of research and writing for exhibits, programs, um, I handle all of the reference work. Um, we have tons of people come in and looking for information about uh, all manner of things, local history and uh, genealogists doing family history and I help people, people with that. So uh, like everybody in the organization, uh, we all wear many hats and uh, fill in all, all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. So, so what, uh, what has been the best part of your job? I think probably working with researchers, um, it's really gratifying to be able to help people find the information that they need. And uh, uh, sometimes that can be really quite emotional for people. We've, I've had a, number, a couple of people, several people actually, break down in tears when they find information that they've been searching for for years and years and we're able to find that for them. That's, that's very gratifying. Uh, so that's probably the favorite, my favorite part of the job. Well, that would be interesting to, to see that. But you, you you talked about how you became, but did you have a love for history as as a younger person uh, or or an archivist, you know, if you will? Did you ever think that's what I'm going to do or did it just happen as you talked about? No, it just happened, really. I got lucky. Um, I, I, I did love history. I've always loved history. I couldn't wait to get into the fourth grade when I was a kid. That was the first year that they taught history in my school. And... Um, uh, both of my parents are great storytellers, and uh, my dad was somewhat older than my mom, and um, uh, he was able to tell me stories about growing up in North Dakota in the 1920s and 1930s and his experiences in the South Pacific during World War II. And, and then my mom uh, was younger, so she, she's able to tell me stories about life as a kid in the 1930s and as a teenager during World War II. And uh, so um, by the time I got into school uh, or into the fourth grade and studying history, I had a pretty good background in local history, at least from the 20th century. 
Yes, sir. Well, can you talk to us about why you're retiring now? Well, um, I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, I planned on retiring when I was 70, uh, but uh, uh, I'm 68 now. Uh, but um, uh, I have Parkinson's, and uh, that's slowing me down a little bit. So I figured I'd want to spend as much time as I could with my friends and family. And uh, so I'm taking off a little early. So uh, so how are you dealing with the diagnosis and, and the symptoms now? Yeah. Well, pretty good so far. Yeah, it's, it's early in the process, but... Uh, um, a few minor things, buttoning cuffs and uh, and uh, those sorts of things. Uh, but yeah, no complaints really so far. I'm doing good. Well, let's talk about a little bit about maybe some of the speaking engagements you've had over the years. Tell us about uh, you know the satisfaction you get presenting to various groups. Well, that's another good part of the job, another fun part of the job. Um, we've got uh, a lot of great information down there at the museum and. Uh, uh, it's really fun to share our history with with people, especially the local people. Um, we have good photo collections, so uh, I started decided decided early on that uh, we should exploit that. And uh, so I've been doing slideshows, used to be thirty five millimeter slides, and uh, now we've moved on to powerpoints. But uh, 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 you know, we've got topics uh, that we range from the prisoner of war, German prisoner of war camp that was in Warhead during World War II, and uh, the building of the Stockwood Field, the big railroad embankment uh, along Highway 10 between Glendon and Holly. That's a good story there. Uh, steamboat industry, there's uh, uh, all sorts of really good history. That we, and being able to share that with people is a lot of fun. Well, expand on that, some of the rich history, if you will, of Clay County and how it was founded and formed. Okay. Well, um, really, uh, Clay County got its start in the early 1870s when the, with the arrival of the Northern Pacific Railway, uh, the first railroad to reach this area up here. Uh, they, they came in uh, late, late, very late in, in 1871. And um, uh, it was a pretty rough and ready town for a while, just for, for a few months anyway. That winter, uh, 71, 72, the railroad didn't build any further west. Uh, they stopped construction. Uh, and um, a lot of near do wells actually showed up on that. And um, uh, there was an altercation between a couple of uh, toughs, a couple of gamblers in uh, April of 1872. And uh, one shot, and the other one killed him. And uh, he had to be handled. So. Uh, they basically, that was the beginning of Clay County government. Uh, uh, they appointed, a, a, a sheriff was appointed, a couple of county commissioners were appointed, some other members, and uh, that's really how the county really began. Uh, it, uh, the county really owes its, its present existence to uh, the arrival of the railroads. Railroads really built this area around here. Well, let's even back it up maybe a little bit more. Huh? How long were indigenous peoples in Clay County prior to European settlements oh, for uh, those moving in? Thousands of years, yeah. It was almost as soon as the glaciers disappeared and Lake Agassiz dried up, uh, uh, Native peoples moved into into what's now Clay County. Um, sadly, their lands were dispossessed in the 1850s, basically by a couple of treaties. Uh, uh, the Ojibwe uh, people in the northeastern part of Clay County and the, the Dakota people in the southwestern part of the county, uh, their lands were taken. Um, as was sadly the case all over the North America uh, in the 18th and 19th century. And, uh, uh, they were subject, subjected to uh, small reservations, and uh, um, it's part of a, a tragic part of our, our local history. And it's something that we cover uh, in more depth in our current permanent or, or long term exhibit uh, in Dajo Manipi. It's, uh, uh, last 150 years of Clay County's history, and we we spend a great deal of time talking about the Native people and uh, their experiences and uh, uh, how they were dispossessed. Yeah. So, who were some of the key important figures, maybe in in sort of the 19th century, uh, with in Moorhead or in Clay County? Well, in terms of development, I suppose one of the key people was uh, Solomon Comstock. Uh, his house is now uh, uh, State Historic Site here in Moorhead. We administer that for uh, the Minnesota Historical Society. And he was a, a very early attorney and um, came actually uh, moving west, uh, worked for the railroad and uh, uh, as a track layer, just in order to get himself out to the west 
So uh, he got to Moorhead and decided to settle down and uh, was appointed county attorney after that gunfight and uh, uh, really built the, the community up, not, not only Moorhead, but uh, he uh, planted towns along the Great Northern Railway and uh, established um, a lot of places where people live today. So he, he was a key figure. Okay. What about some of the projects you were involved in? Of course, several here with Prairie Public, you know, yes. stories and documentaries. And, you know, you really became the go-to person uh, for Clay County history mm -hmm. questions. But are there any projects that stand out to you? Oh, my. Yeah, some of the things that we did with you guys, uh, uh, we did a crack up, bang up job on uh, steamboat industry, and we were able to help with that. Um, uh, well, we put together exhibits over at the museum regularly. Uh, we're in the Yumcom Center, of course, and people know all about the, the ship, uh, the Yumcom ship, the Viking ship, uh, replica Viking ship, and the Steve Church. And we administer those for the city of Moorhead and respond. And, and, um, uh, in kind, we get uh, use of the facility for storage and for offices and things like that. But, so we're all, so people can, you know, th people sometimes say, well, I saw the ship, I don't have to go back. Well, but there's all kinds of new stuff we're putting together all the time. Like I mentioned, the 150th anniversary exhibit that we've got up right now. Uh, we just closed an exhibit about Ralph's Corner Bar, which is a, a mainstay in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, it was a, a, a wonderful dive bar. And uh, we have another exhibit cur currently right now uh, commemorating the 10th anniversary of, the, of um, uh, uh, mixed marriage or gay marriage in, in Minnesota. And uh, so we're changing exhibits all the time. Um, a lot of fun stuff over the years. Uh, one of my favorite projects really was working with uh, uh, local people who are uh, uh, collectors of uh, art from a couple of uh, artists here, Moorhead or Fargo, or rather Clay County artists, uh, Orabel Thortfoot and uh, Annie Stein. And both of those ladies uh, produced art in the 1920s and 1930s. And uh, we had an exhibit a few years ago f f focusing on that. And uh, their art, uh, this really is the first time anybody had put a similar exhibit together uh, here in the upper Midwest about women artists. And uh, it was received with, uh, with great polite praise. We uh, received a, an award from the American Association for State and Local History for it. So uh, that was a real, real high point. Hmm. Uh, we've done a lot of things. and. Uh, you're also asked to, to speak and present about Fargo history as well. Of course, the relationship only separated by the river, I guess. Right. Uh, but, you know, you become kind of the expert for that as well uh, as uh, Clay County, it seems. Is that correct? Well, uh, I don't know if I'm an expert, but uh, the two communities are really one community. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, so I've been asked to do a little research for over the, the site of the uh, the pre present library, I was able to do research for that. Um, uh, also, um, Mid-America Steel site, some people were interested in the history of that, so I did some research on that and put together a PowerPoint. Uh, a couple of other things, but uh, mostly I stick to the Moorhead side of the river, I know that best. Okay, but uh, you know, let's, can you talk some about the relationships you've formed over the years in your job and the people you've met? What What's that meant to you? Well, yeah. Well, um, our volunteers over the years, we've had some tremendous and great people to work with. Um, our present staff, um, uh, everybody on staff, uh, I, I really admire and, uh, and, uh, and like and respect. And it's great working with those guys. Uh, uh, I work with some of the best people in Clay County and uh, uh, I just love to come to work every day to, uh, to be with them and uh, I'm gonna miss that. I'm gonna miss uh, being with my, my coworkers. Yeah. So uh, is someone set to succeed you yet? Yes, a uh, young lady named Petra Gunderson, uh, and she's going to be taking over uh, at the beginning of the year, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to training her in more. Okay. Well, wait, can you tell us maybe a, a couple of uh, unknown parts of Clay County history that might be of interest to our viewers? 
Oh, well, I touched on a couple of things earlier. I mentioned the, the German prisoner of war mm -hmm. camp and that uh, that really surprises people. Uh, um, even during the war, there I spoke when I was doing the research for the projects, I spoke to a lot of people who lived here in Moorhead during the war and they had no idea that there was a camp there. It wasn't hidden or anything, but uh, it was just something that kind of people passed over and are really interested in it now. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what makes history of this area so special, do you think? Well, lo every place has local history. And, um, uh, I, you know, I love all kinds of history, uh, international world history, but uh, the, the things that happen just on the street and around the corner, I think people are, have a real, can have a real more, more connection with them. And um, being able to share that with people is a, is a great part of my job. Do you have any favorite exhibits that have been displayed over the years uh, well, that, mentioned, that stand out a little bit? I don't, yeah, maybe a couple more. Have, yeah. Um, oh, our current exhibit I'm really proud of. We, uh, we've had a, a number of, actually I mentioned uh, awards from the American Association for State and Local History. We've uh, had a number of those. Uh, we had one on World War II, home front World War II a few years ago that was a good exhibit. Um, uh, I've drawn a blank. Yeah, well, there's just been so many over the years. I, uh, but you know, they, there you go. So, what are your plans in retirement? Do you have anything special, or you plan to stay in the area? Yeah, yeah I'll stick around. I'll stick around. Uh, I don't mind the winters that bad. Um, and I hope, hope to do some traveling uh, next spring, uh, more camping, hiking, things like that, as long as I can, and. Uh, uh, I'll keep my hand in uh, in at the museum. I've been asked if I could come back once in a while and do some help and help some out. So I'll be doing that sort of thing too. So well, looking forward to And I to understand it. you recently got to travel to Norway. That's right. Yeah, we worked with a uh, with an exhibit or with a museum over in Norway, West Telemark, Norway, about uh, a bilingual exhibit and book that we put together about um, a family that came from West Telemark to Clay County and they settled in along the Buffalo River in 1870. And uh, uh, that was a real success. And they invited me over to, there to speak about the process of working with them. And uh, uh, it, was, it was a great trip. It's a beautiful country. It's a, it's a great place to go. I was, I was very fortunate. Wow. Well, we're out of time, but if people want more information, where can they go? Well, they go to our website. and. Uh, uh, www.hcsonline.org. Well, there you go. So we wish you the best in your retirement, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, John. Stay tuned for more. An incredible exhibit currently on display for the next two years at the Heritage Center in Bismarck celebrates Native American storytellers from across North Dakota. Titled, On the Edge of the Wind, Native Storytellers and the Land, the exhibit invites the visitors to watch these stories and to learn about the relationship between the land and the first peoples of North Dakota. Grandfather, we thank you for this beautiful land that's given us life. All our brothers and all our sisters, we thank all of those who come to listen. May we walk away with a good feeling of this land and a new understanding of our story. If you think about who you are, you are your mother, you are your father. We are the land. Our ancestors all the way back to Creator, they're here. This exhibit began probably about 11 years ago. What we really wanted to show in the exhibit is you can look at a tree or you could look at a rock or a butte and it might be beautiful, but we don't really know what we're looking at. And the storytellers really revealed to me what was there. It's more than a butte or a lake to many of the Native Americans. It's a spirituality. It's a place where they get power. It's a place where they heal. It's a place that they receive messages and interact with the supernatural. I think that what I would like the people to 
remember about this exhibit is that we live on this earth and this earth is a wondrous, powerful, and sometimes very supernatural place where there are unusual things. It's really encouraging to hear the response of the non-Native people. I stopped by the museum desk here a couple times and they said it's really powerful to a lot of people. And then I hear folks back home, they say, I knew you did this, but I didn't know you did that. <laughs> So we get them to realize that we're carrying on these traditions. Our school children have come down by the buses and they're just really happy. That's my grandpa. <laughs> so it's humbling. I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to do this because it's not just about Native people, it's about North Dakota. I started working with Troy about three years ago, putting this exhibit together. I have been thrilled by the numbers going through this gallery. The very first day it was open, we had more than 250 just school kids. We tried to give people options to delve into the stories because they're so important to the overall experience. You have access in the gallery space. We also have a small theater space here in the building where you can also sit and listen to the stories in your own time. And then they're also available online. The takeaway I would like to see really is that there is a parallel way of looking at the environment and the land. We're just scratching the surface with this exhibition. Storytelling has always been a part of my family. My grandfathers, my uncles, said, well, there was this boy, but there was this eagle, and there was this buffalo, and they would tell stories about how the strength of those animals gave those human strength. Sometimes the uh, stars would help the people and the plants that gave us the strength and the vision to do these things. So those were very important to me. Having that connection to the world around us, these stories gave me strength. These stories empowered me. It gives us hope. It gives us hope because so many years we had to be silent. And it gives us hope that our future will be filled with that Bimadism and the good life. Because within our stories, they tell us how to live in a good way. The buffalo went through the very same thing that you did as a people. They tried to exterminate you by putting you on a reservation where life was very hard and you didn't have food. And the same thing happened to the buffalo. They were shot en masse from trains and so forth and left to rot and die on the prairie. And those that remained, they said they put them in a park like Yellowstone. Yet they survived and your people survived. There are lessons like that that we learn from people, from the environment and the animals and other living things around us. My favorite story, it's the star in the cottonwood tree. It's just such a sweet, charming story. That one is a wonderful story, how the little star came and heard all these wonderful sounds and wanted to stay. But the other stars scolded him and told him, you belong up here. But he was a persistent and he finally came down and they told him he could come down and stay if he could find a place where he would not distract the people because the people had to work. So then he looked and there was the cottonwood tree. These storytellers, they've given their lives to these stories, to preserving these stories, to continuing these stories, not for themselves, but for their children and their grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren. That's what that circle of life is. We're all connected. And that's what these stories are telling us. Live a good life together. Take care of each other. Not just people. Trees, the wind, the rain. Take care of the water, the birds. We always give thanks to the earth itself and always try to walk with respect because if we don't realize that all of the earth has power and energy, 
then we might not be able to receive whatever that particular place has for us. We're an oral people. We always pass things on. And so if my witness is not there to witness and, and verify my story over time, now this is going to be there forever. Anybody can see it. So we have to tell the truth. We have to tell it right. So to bring all of these storytellers from around North Dakota, from the many different tribes, it's all about the earth. It's all about the people. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.